for being our wonderful king. Thank you for being there for us. Thank you because all things that pertain to life and godliness you have already given to us. Tonight, oh Lord, we just want to say thank you for your unmerited favor, your grace, your goodness, your kindness that has been given to us. We thank you because we are children of God. We thank you that your word tonight, oh Lord, we impart lives and we change lives, we change destinies in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness and your loving kindness. We give you praise now, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Tonight, we pray that your people will be blessed, that your name will be glorified, that all praise and all glory we go to your name. We thank you, Almighty God, because this is of your own doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. All right. I want to say thank you very much for joining. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about part three of the uh, message, the heart and mouth connection that we've been doing um, over the past um, couple of weeks, uh, this month of July. Uh, so tonight, I'm going to be talking about part three. Last week, I did a broadcast on part three, but there was some problem with it, with the broadcast, so I had to delete the video. So hopefully today will be will be all right. Okay, all right. Let's start. My name is Davis Bamingoy, and again, I welcome you to this uh, broadcast tonight. Okay, so in Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-seven, the Bible says that uh, God said, "Let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness." And after God has made the man, God did something profound. God blessed the man. God blessed the man. God did something profound and he blessed the man. And he says, you know what? They should be fruitful. They should replenish the earth. They should, you know, fulfill the mandate that he has given them. So essentially when God made man, when, he, when I use the word man, I'm talking about man and woman, obviously. When God made man in his own image, what God did basically was God made man to be a replica of or a replica of who he is. So man is like God, essentially. All right. So now, um, when we look in the story of creation in Book of Genesis chapter one, in Book of Genesis chapter one, from verse one to three, we see something there where the Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God then and the Bible then says, and the earth that God created was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So essentially, when you look at that scripture, those set of scriptures, you see something there. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless, was void, was um, was something that is um, like an amoeba shape. It, there was no life there. It was filled with darkness. But the Spirit of God was waiting for a command. It was waiting for a command. It was brewed over the surface of the deep, deep and it was waiting for a command. And God spoke the command out of his mouth and there was light. God said, light be, and there was light. So we see here that God spoke what he wanted, not what he saw. Obviously, God saw the, uh, the, the way the world was. God saw the earth that he has created, the way it is now looking. But God didn't say, oh, the heart is so, is so rubbish. Nothing is working here. God spoke what he wanted. Basically, God brought order to, to the earth that was devoid of life. God brought life to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the earth that was without life. God brought life into that. Okay. Now, we also see an amazing thing that happened in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 to 20, which again shows us uh, the power that God has conferred on man. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 to 20, the Bible says that, um, and out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the hair and brought them unto Adam to see what he will call, he will call them. And whatsoever Adam called every single living creature, that was the name thereof. I wanted to pay attention to what he, that is saying. So basically saying God gives so much authority and dominion to man that whatever man says called anything, that's what God says. It is God never contested. Not one name did God contest. So if if the if the if uh, um um <laughs> an animal is brought before Adam and Adam says this one is a goat, and that's it. God said, Goat, so it so be it. Which means that God is saying something to us here that says there's a position that you have and I have that what we say basically goes. What we say with our mouth, 
our mouths go. You know, you know what we say goes. Essentially, we, we reap what we say from our mouth. All right. So um, that is one thing to just notice there. The other thing to note is that in verse 20, the Bible says, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was no found an herb fit for him. Essentially, what he's saying here is Adam had control over the creation of God. Adam control over the creation of God. Here, he did not say that he did not say that Adam had control over another human being because you see, Adam named everything, but Adam did not have somebody who was fit for him. So Adam had control over all the creation that God has, which means Adam can speak to the mountains, Adam can speak to the to the hair, Adam can speak to the ground because he had he had a power. Now, in Psalm eight, verse four to six, Psalm eight, verse four to six, the Bible says that who is man that you are mindful of him? Who is the son of man that, that your heart is filled with him, that you, that you think about him? The Bible here says, you have crowned him with glory and honor, and you have placed him over all the works of your hands. Again, he's talking about Adam here. He's talking about people. Um, Adam, uh, you know, it's not talking about, he hasn't talk, spoken about Jesus. He hasn't even spoken about a, a born again Christian. He's talking about every human being out there. God placed man, you know what, as the epitome of the, of the as the crowning glory of his creation. So that is who you are. Now, in Christ Jesus, praise God. The Bible says we have been we have been elevated. We have made to, we have been made to sit together with Christ in the heavenly places. And what this means essentially is that um, you are now we are now seated at the realm of God. You know, in book of that Psalm eight, you know, um, um, when the Bible says Psalm eight verse four to six, when the Bible says you have made him a little lower than the angels, actually it's saying that you have made him a little lower than. His, than Elohim. You have made him a little lower than yourself. So man is placed a little lower than God. You know, now, now essentially in Christ, because we now have the spirit of Christ living in us when we give our life to Jesus, God has placed us to sit together with Christ in heaven. So in heaven, you are seated together beside Jesus in heaven. All right. That is above principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this world. Now, here's the thing to take away. Number one is God speaks what he wants. And because you are created in the image and likeness of God, you have to speak what you want. You are designed to speak what you want. You are not designed to speak what you don't want. You know why? Because when you say a thing out of your mouth, it becomes a command. When you say a thing, when you say a thing out of your mouth, it begins to go out and begins to find a way to become a creation for you. In Romans chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says that God calls those things that be not as though they were. God calls those things that be not as though they were. So God called light out of darkness. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, the same God that spoke light to come out, out of darkness is the same God who spoke that same light into our heart so that we may know him and we may know the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What that is saying basically is that the same command that God gave for light to come upon darkness or light to come out of darkness and overcome darkness is the same um, light that God has shown in our heart. Is the same light, the word that brought light, is the same word that, was, that brought light into our heart so that we may know the glory of God. Praise God forevermore. Now, in John chapter 17, when Jesus Christ was about to leave planet Earth, he says something profound. He said, the glory which you have given to me, I give to them. The glory which you have given to me, I give to them, which means that whatever Adam lost in, in, in the Garden of Eden, God restored that back in Jesus to everyone who believes. Now, can you see now the amount of power that you have? If Adam could name the animals in the Old Testament, how much more power that you, do you have now as a child of God, blood-bought believer? Of, 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 of the Lord Jesus Christ, how, how much more power do you have? Do you see now why it is erroneous for you to open your mouth and say things anyhow? Because what you say, we go. What you say, we go. So, see, if we are created in the image of God, it behooves us a responsibility, therefore, to act like God. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children of God, which means watch what God does. And just do the same because a, a, a child is meant to imitate is our parent. Amen. So God expects you to speak the way he speaks. If you speak what you don't want, beloved, you are going to get what you don't want. Okay. And if you speak what you want, you are going to get what you want.
That's the way it is, as simple as that. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 28, Numbers 14, 28, the Bible says that have you were spoken in my ears this day, so will I do unto you. This is when the children of Israel came out and they began to grumble and they began to complain. And God said, the way, same way you spoke of, that's what you're going to get. Essentially, he's basically saying, because you are God's, you are a child of God, when you speak word out of your mouth, it begins to put, it begins to take the shape of what you have said. So, friends, words matter. Words are things. Words are, but, but the words that are things, the words that create the world that we live in, they are offshoot of the heart. In Matthew 12, 34, Jesus Christ says this to the Pharisees. He says, you brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, say anything good? He said, how can you, who is, who, how can you, who is inherently evil? How can you say anything good? He basically says that you cannot say words that are contradictory to the nature that you have. He says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Yeah, the Bible says your heart determines the direction of your life. If what has been going on with you lately? If what has been going on with you lately is not according to what God has ordained for you, it means that your heart is not being filled with what God has in store for you. It means that your heart is being filled with a negative view. You have been watching or filling your mind with things that are not of God, and that's why it's not producing a result in your life. Proverbs 10, 11 says, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Think about that. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, which means the person who is righteous, we always say words that will build up another life. So, but the mouth of the wicked, they conceal violence. Okay. And if you look in Proverbs 15, 28, the Bible says the heart of the righteous studies to answer, which means the heart of the righteous studies to answer and the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. So essentially you can say the heart of the, of the righteous thinks about what he's going to say, ponders on the things he's going to say, and what is what the heart of the righteous says out of the mouth is what builds up life. So you can say the heart thinks about what to say, the mouth says it out. Amen? That's why Romans chapter 10 verse 10 says, with the heart you believe, you think about what is going on, you believe it, and with the mouth confession is made unto, unto salvation. So you cannot say words that are contrary to your heart beliefs. I'll say that again. You cannot say words that are contrary to your heart beliefs. And God always answers the prayers of the heart. At times, you know, you might see some people who are praying some wrong prayers and they're getting results. God looks at the heart. The Bible says God is a hard God. In Proverbs 21, verse 2, the Bible says, a man may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. So God always looks at our heart. Okay. Okay. Now, um, Proverbs 24, 12. Proverbs 24 says, if you say, but we know nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? It's essentially, if you say, God, I don't know what's going on here. God says, I'm looking at your heart. Okay. Does he, does, does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Essentially, it's talking about the fact that your heart determines what you say. Your heart also controls your behavior. And by the laws of sowing and reaping, when you do some evil things, you're going to reap what you've done. All right? So this is the reason why God answers the prayers of our heart. God does not answer the prayers of what you say alone, which means when you are praying, be conscious of what your heart is holding on to. That is very profound. That's very important. Amen? Luke's, Luke chapter 6, verse 45 says this. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up, on, up in his heart. A good man brings good things out of the good that is stored in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. So for the mouth speaks what a heart is full of. Now, when you look at this scripture carefully, it's saying, number one, when you are righteous, you will produce good works. Why do you produce good works? Because the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So now it's linking the heart to the mouth to the action. So there's the heart believes, there's the mouth that speaks, and there's the result that you get. And if you go back to the book of Genesis chapter 1, this is exactly the way God works. God believes in his heart. God spoke and God says, what I have done is good. So essentially, your, your heart believes, your mouth speaks, it, it caused a creation to happen. And when you look at the creation, it must match the image that you have in your heart already. And therefore, you can say, this is good. So I want to ask you a question. If the results you're getting so far is not what you're, you're, you're meant to be getting, it's not what you really desire to get, I may ask you to check, what have you been meditating upon? 
What have you been aligned to, to, to dominate your heart? What have you been speaking out of your mouth? If I want to know somebody, what, what somebody stores up in their heart, you know what? How, how I know the easiest way for me to know is what they say out of their mouth. The Bible says, by their fruits, we shall know them. Which means when you are constantly seeing words of negativity, words of fertility, words of discouragement, that is what your heart is being riddled with. Now, we all go through certain challenges and times where, you know, life seems to be pressing us left, right and center. And during this period, um, we feel like we're being pushed and we're being pressed left, right and center. But beloved, I, I beg of you, even during this period of time, never voice the words of discouragement, never voice the words of discontent, never voice the words of negativity, never voice the words of helplessness. Because when you say those words out, they take on the shape of what you've said. Mm -hmm. What you might say during that period is, God, help me to see where I'm missing it. Lord, help me in my own belief. You could say words like that. And that's basically a, a heart cry to God for oh, God to help you through this situation. And God who sees the heart will answer your prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Proverbs 18.21. Proverbs 18.21 says, what can bring death and what can bring life? Bible says, what can bring death or life? Talk too much and you will eat everything that you say. So what this is saying, friends, is that you will read, you will reap what you say with your mouth. If those things have become a heart belief, remember, you are gods. You are gods, which means you are made in the image and likeness of God, and therefore you have authority and dominion in this place. So I encourage you to choose your words wisely. So we have a couple of stories. I've got three stories here over the next 10, 15 minutes that I'm going to then try to use to buttress this point. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Matthew chapter, no, sorry, Matthew chapter 9, verse 18, and uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 23, whichever one you want to go in there. There's a story here about a man named Jairus. Jairus is one of the Pharisees, and uh, his daughter was at the point of death. It, actually, in the book of Mark, it says the daughter is already dead, okay? Matthew, Mark chapter 5, and in verse 23, uh, the Bible says that, no, actually I start from um, uh, verse 22. And behold, there comes one to him, rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, and besought him greatly, uh, besought him greatly, uh, saying, see, he besought him greatly, saying, um, um, my daughter lies at the point of death. I pray you. Come and lay your hands on, on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Now, listen to that statement very well. He's saying, my daughter lays at the point of death. I ask you to come. I pray you come and lay your hands on her and not if and, and she shall live. So essentially, this man, if you go back to the fact that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The man is basically has already believed that when Jesus Christ lays his hands on this daughter, this daughter will be healed. That is the, the mouth is saying what the heart believes. Now in verse 20, 20, 24, and Jesus Christ went with him and many people followed him and crowded him. Now, if you go back to in the book of Matthew chapter, chapter 9, you realize that the Bible says Jesus Christ left immediately, which means that the moment the guy came and started to uh, ask him uh, uh, what the heart, what the heart believed, I begin to say what's to him and I believe Jesus Christ started immediately uh, to go out and um and attend to these guys issues all right he just started there and began to go and attend to him all right so he went now there was an interruption in this in this uh, conversation which they introduced another scenario which is the woman with the issues of blood the woman with issues of blood um he has been he has been she has been dealing with these issues of blood for for 12 years in verse 25 and she has suffered Bible says she has suffered many things from the hand of physicians. Basically, she's been dealing with these issues of blood for many years and she has not had healing. Now, here's the thing to know. In the book of Leviticus, uh, the Bible talks about the law of when somebody has blood coming from their body, they are meant to be ostracized. They are not meant to be part of the community. So this woman was taking a daring act of faith to come and find Jesus. Basically, she's been pushed to the wall to the point where she says, you know what, I gotta get my answer or not. Now, she came, and the Bible says in verse 20, 27, when she had heard of Jesus, when she had heard, not just one way, when she had heard of Jesus, okay, she came in the crowd behind and touched his garment. 
Now, in the Amplified Version, the Bible says that it, it touched the, the garment of Jesus. Now, but in verse 28, it says, for she, as he said, she said continually to herself, she has been saying over and over to herself that if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. So here is a thing here. Because of the internal conversation she's been having with herself, she's been saying over and over and over again, if I can just touch the hem of the garment, if I can just touch the hem of the garment, if I can just touch the hem of the garment, the Bible said because that has become a hard belief out of the, the power of repetition that she said over and over to herself, it becomes a hard belief. And therefore our belief system says, you know, if I touch the hem of the garment, I'm going to be made whole. Sure. So she didn't even voice the words out. She said to herself internally, She's been saying, if I touch the hem of the garment, I'm going to be made whole. And guess what? She was healed immediately she did that. Now, here's, a, here's the thing that I want you to take away from that, that God responds to a heart-led prayer. God responds all the time to a heart-led prayer. God responds to a heart, a heart prayer that is coming from a heart that believes. Faith always moves in the direction of the heart that believes. Now, because here, um, in verse... Um, Verse 34, Jesus Christ said unto her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be well of your plague. Now, what this is saying that Jesus Christ said, Your faith has made you whole. The Bible did not say, Jesus Christ said, I have healed you. No, it says, Your faith has made you whole. Now, in the Amplified Version, this is what it says. It says, Your, your heart trust and believe in me has made you well. I'm asking you a question tonight. What do you believe God for? What have you believed God for? You know, at times we may think we believe, but as we check our heart and we begin to see the actions that we're taking, the actions we're taking at times suggest that we don't believe. So I've said this before. Uh, one time I said, if you believe God that, let's, let's say, for example, you're, you're looking for a mortgage and things are looking so bleak, you think you can't get a mortgage because obviously you don't have a good credit rating. When you pray to God and you believe in your heart that God has answered you, you could go ahead and just begin to walk, act out as if the mortgage has already been given to you. This is the proof of the fact that you believe, of you believe. The proof of the fact that you believe must must um, must show itself in the actions that you take. So again, remember what we said earlier that you you believe in your heart, you speak with your mouth, and you act. So if you don't act after you say you believe, you have not really believed because faith is now. Faith believes that what it says has already happened. Like for example, when my if any of my children is sick and I ask them, have you prayed to God? And I, and I used to, when I pray with them, I say, I used to tell them, faith believes it has received what he prays for. So that's the, that's the, that's the attitude you must have. Now, I'm not saying I get it right all the time, okay? I, we all work in progress. But what we are saying is that you should make sure that you keep on working out your salvation, all right? Essentially, as you put uh, this to practice, you begin to grow in it. Faith is like a muscle. As you put your faith to work, it begins to grow. You know, if you don't put your faith to work, it's like if you don't go to, go to the gym, what's going to happen? Your muscles are going to be flaccid, nothing's going to work. But as you put your faith to work, it will begin to work for you. So I challenge you today. What do you believe God for? What have you believed God for? I'm asking you, let your heart be saturated. Be like the woman with the shoes of blood that says, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Keep saying that to yourself over and over and over again. That's why I tell people, affirmation is not ru it's not rubbish. If the first time you're saying it, your heart begins to tell you, oh, this is a bunch of a, a bunch of wrong things, not going to work, keep at it. After a while, over a period of time, your heart will begin to believe what you said. Remember, if you, if you tell a lie for such a long time, that lie is where your heart will begin to believe the lie to be the truth. I don't know about you. If you may have told yourself some lies over the past years, after a while, it becomes a hard belief. Now, when the truth comes, your heart doesn't even know whether it's truth or not because you have believed a lie. So in the same way, affirmation is a, is a way of influencing your heart to believe the truth of what the word of God says. All right. So we see here in Mark chapter 5 that this woman received a healing because she kept saying to herself, and then she took action. All right, so you two must keep saying to yourself what you want from God, and you take action believing that it has been granted. Remember the Bible says in the book of 1 John that this is the, uh, this is the uh, confidence that we have before him, that when we ask anything in his name, he hears us. So which is saying that when we ask anything according to the will of God, God answers us. So healing, is it part of God's will? 100%. Living in prosperity, is it part of God's will? 100%. Having, a, having peace in your home, is it part of God's will? 100%. The Bible says, therefore, keep saying it. Keep saying it, I have peace in my home. I have peace in my body. My youth is renewed. As you keep saying those words out of your mouth, guess what? They are going into your body. Because remember, you are 
made in the image and likeness of God. And because Adam had control over the, over the universe and that restoration, uh, what he lost has been restored to you in Jesus, you have also dominion over everything that God has created. Psalm 8, 6 says, God has given us dominion over all the work, all the works of the hands of God. Amen. So let's quickly go further. And then um, now in verse 35, Mark chapter 5, verse 35, the Bible says that while Jesus Christ was still speaking to this woman with issues of blood, people then came from the ruler's house and said, don't bother the master again. Your, child, your, your, your daughter is already dead. Now look at what Jesus Christ said. Jesus Christ said, as soon as Jesus Christ heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. Now, in the other translation that I have, it says, don't, don't stop believing. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't Just keep believing. Keep believing in me. So I ask you a question. Are there things that you believe in God for and it seems like it looks so hopeless? It looks like it's not going to work. I'm asking you today, keep believing. Don't stop believing. Don't stop believing the promises of God. Don't stop believing what God has told you. Don't stop believing that what God has promised you will come to pass. Because when you when you stop believing, then that is when it doesn't work. The Bible says in the book of uh, Mark eleven twenty four. It says, "When you shall say unto a thing, and you shall not doubt in your heart, so you're going to receive it." Which means you keep saying it even when it doesn't make sense. Is it easy? No. But the Bible says the just shall live by faith. To live by faith means we believe the promises of what the Word of God says above our senses. Because our senses will put us in bondage. What our friends says, what our friends say, will put us in bondage. But God wants us to live by what His Word says. Because the Bible says that the grasses, grasses, grasses may wither, uh, and the earth may fade away. The Bible says that. But those who, who those who do the will of God, they will abide forever. Why is that? Because the words of God abide forever. Amen. So don't let your heart be troubled. All right. So now, when in verse thirty-seven, just Christ, the Bible says. He went into the house of this uh, uh, this um, uh, this Pharisee, this Jairus person, and he did not allow anybody to follow him except for Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. Okay, and when he comes out of the ruler of the synagogue, he, he saw the tumult and those who wept and wept great, greatly, and he says to them, "Why are you making such a, a, a such a do and weep? This child is not dead but sleeps." So you see, Christ is speaking by faith. He's speaking by faith. He's saying, look, this child is not, is not dead, but asleep. So just Christ, again, going back to Genesis chapter 1, he followed that principle. He did not say what he did not say what he saw. He said what he wanted to see. Amen. And that is why I said you are not designed to say what you don't want. Amen. So, and they laughed him to scorn. They laughed him to scorn. But when he put them out, see, he had to put them out first. When he put them out, he takes the father and the mother of the child and those who are with him and enter in uh, where the child was. And he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is interpreted, little girl, I say unto you, arise. So one of the key things to note, to note here is this. You have to be careful of your association. You must learn to dissociate yourself from negative people. People who only look at the things from the point of the natural or the point of the flesh, get away from them. God cannot function in an atmosphere of unbelief. I'll say that again. God cannot function in an atmosphere of unbelief. In Psalm 78 verse 41, Psalm 78 verse 41, the Bible says they tested God. They limited the only one of Israel. How did they limit him? Psalm 78 verse 18 to 19 says, they said, can God provide food in the wilderness? Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Essentially, God has done all of these things for them, brought them out of Egypt, performed all the miracles for them and gave them manna in the wilderness. They keep saying, can God do this? Can God do this? And because they kept not trusting God, they kept not believing God, guess what? The Bible said God was limited to act in their lives. So I'm asking you today that if you have friends that are saying, oh, they are looking at everything you want to do only from the realm of the natural, don't talk to them. Don't get your don't put don't put your faith in them. Don't share your vision, your dreams with them because they are going to kill it. They're going to stop the power of God to move in your life. Remember, you are not designed. You are not designed to say what you don't want. Amen. So that is uh, the the other point. Now, the last point I want to make is in the book of um, um, Matthew chapter six, Matthew chapter six, from verse five to thirteen. Um, I will ask you to read that uh, later, but I'm just going to paraphrase what is in there so you can you can understand it. In Matthew chapter six, verse five to thirteen, um, what was sorry in um, sorry? Let's look at Luke Luke seven seven to ten. Luke seven seven to ten. Here, what happened here is um, the fact that 
there was a centurion servant I mentioned that last week, centurion servant that was sick. And um, just guys, the man came and said that just Christ should come to his house and come and heal. And he just said, My master, my, my servant is sick. Just Christ said, I'm going to come and heal him. He said, No, do not come. Do not come. I am also a man under authority. I said to one, Come. And they come, I said to another, go, and they go. So just say the word only. Now, this guy believed that if Christ spoke the word, do, do the word over the, the servant, the servant will be healed. Now, just Christ turned around and said, told people and said, look, I have not seen such a great faith in Israel. Basically, somebody that believed God based on what the word of God says, without having seen physical manifestation, God says this person is a person of faith. Is that not the same thing that happened to Abraham? When the Bible says Abraham believed God, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, which means when it was hopeless, when it doesn't look like it was going to work, the Bible says Abraham hoped against hope, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, the Bible says against hope, he believed in hope. And he trusted the God who says, I will make you a father of many nations. So when God speaks the word to you, and it, it, please, it will not make sense. It will not make sense. But you must believe it because when you believe it, that's when you're walking by faith. And remember that God can be limited. God can be limited um, by the words that we speak. God can be limited by the words that we speak. So we must learn to choose words that we speak carefully. Amen. We must learn to choose the words that we speak carefully. Amen. So it is very important, therefore, to speak what what we want to see, not what um, not what um, not what we are seeing. We have to we have to speak what we want to see. Why is that? God looks at the heart. Man looks at outward appearance. In First Samuel chapter sixteen verse seven, when King David wanted to be selected, Samuel went there and he saw all of these his brothers and with all their physique and the way they look. And God said, I rejected all of them because God looks at the heart. Man looks at outward appearances. So that's why I keep saying God answers the prayers of the heart. Now, I want to show you something quickly as a random. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Uh, uh, from verse 18. Matthew chapter 9, I want to show you something that the words that you speak, they are prayers. In Matthew chapter 9, in verse 18. The Bible says, why he spoke these things unto them? Behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, worshipped him, saying, my daughter is even now dead, but come lay your hand upon her and she shall live. So you see, if you believe that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, this guy came to Jesus Christ and say something, which means you have to speak over the things that if you want to get a result. That story of uh, Jairus' daughter, that when Jesus Christ says, Talitha Kumi, Little girl, I say unto you, arise. It is exactly the same thing. Just guys call, call the dead girl. I say, this little girl, I say unto you, arise. You two have to say, body, I say unto you, be healed. Job, I say unto you, come. Um, child, I say unto you, come. Do you understand? If you're looking for a child, say, womb, I say unto you, produce in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, remember, you must carry the image that you are seated together with Christ in the heavenly places as you pronounce these things. If you don't carry the image of the fact that you are united with God and that you are, and it is the faith of Jesus Christ that you are using, see that is going to tell, start telling you who do you think you are, you that you lied yesterday, you that you did this, no, no nothing is going to happen. And as you begin, if you begin to walk in doubt, nothing is going to work for you. Remember Mark 11, 24 says, if you say unto the mountain and you don't doubt in your heart, you will receive what you say. So I'm asking you tonight that you should Hold fast to the word of God. Don't allow your heart to be to be befuddled. Don't allow yourself to be befuddled. Remember, if you say it over and over to your heart, you are united together with Christ, which means the words that you speak carry power. Amen. So that's Matthew 9, 18. Now let's look at Matthew, uh, Matthew 9, 21. If this is the woman now, for she said within herself, if I may be touched his garment, I shall be well. So she said within herself. So there's a saying that produces results. But she said within where? Our heart. So the heart believes, the mouth speaks. Okay? This is the voice of the heart that is speaking. Amen? Now, let's look at verse 27. Verse 27. And when Jesus Christ departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying and saying. So they cried and said. So you see, in my note here, in the uh, in my Bible, there's a note that says, every single time you hear the word, you see the word say, those things I, I quoted earlier, they're actually words of prayer. In, Mark, in, in that same Matthew 11, Matthew 11, 25, Matthew 11, 25, uh, Jesus Christ, at that time, Jesus Christ answered and said, I thank thee, 
O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Just guys began to thank God, but he spoke. So we see that, therefore, every word of your mouth is a prayer. Every word of your mouth is a prayer. Every word that you speak out of your mouth is a prayer. Therefore, be careful what prayer you are offering out of your mouth. Now, remember I said, God answers the prayers of our heart. So if you are not getting the result you're looking for, if you think you're not getting what you are meant to be getting, check what you have been thinking about. Check what you have been saying from your mouth. Check the kind of friends that you keep. Are you hanging out with unbelievers? Are you hanging out with people who are, even though they are professing themselves to be Christians, but they always speak words of negativity, words of unbelief? Get away from them because they are going to poison your faith. Are you looking at the, the world economy or the things around you and using that to, to make a decision about your future? That will limit you. God is a God of unlimited resources. So tonight, I'm asking you, choose your words wisely. Remember, Numbers 14, 28 says, as you have said in my ears this day, will I do unto you? God is saying, your words carry power because your words, they are words of creation. Because your words are words of creation because you are made in the image and likeness of God. So saturate your heart with the truth of God's words until it flows out of your mouth. So when the challenges of life come, when challenges of life come to you, the first thing you will say are the words that you are stored up in your heart. You will not say what that you have not stored up in your heart, okay? Because that's the way God is. As a man thinks in his heart, so easy. As a man thinks, as a man meditates in his heart, so easy. Your heart is where your life is. And your heart can be influenced by the words that you speak over it. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And faith is a product of the heart. So as you focus on the word of God over and over again, it will begin to influence the way your heart is shaped out. And as your heart is shaped by the words you, you, you saturate it with, your heart will then begin to flow out of your mouth by the words that you speak. Romans 10, 10 says, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. We do not receive if we don't speak. We do not receive if we don't believe in our heart. We do not receive if you don't take action. So here's the thing as, as a roundup. For faith to work for you, it must, it must be present in three places. Faith must be present in the word of God. Faith must be present in your heart. Faith must be present in the words you speak. And therefore, as you speak those things, the Holy Spirit will lead you to take actions that align with the words that you believe in your heart, with the words that you say out of your mouth, and the, with the words and the promises of God that are in the Bible. Remember, faith can only work based on what the grace of God has provided for. If the grace of God has not provided for it, faith cannot work for it. Praise God forevermore. All right, as we round up, here is what I'm, I'm going to pray. I'm going to say, Lord Almighty, I pray for your children tonight that even as they go up this week, they will remember, they will know that the heart is a seat of life. But the heart that is the seed of life for a child of God is already been renewed after the image of Jesus Christ, which means we already have a good heart. Lord, I thank you that we have a good heart. And because we have a good heart, Lord Almighty God, I thank you that these truths of your words, they are already in our heart. Help us, O oh Lord, to cause those truths to come alive as we feed the truth with the truth of the word of God. Let us feed our heart, O oh God, every day with the promises of God, so much so that our heart will be saturated with the word of God. And therefore, out of the abundance of these words that are in our heart, our mouth will speak of your goodness. And as our mouth speak, as our mouth speak of your goodness, the words that we speak will go out into the future to create the world that we want. Because this is the way God created the universe. Lord, we thank you because your word says every, every seed will produce after its kind. Therefore, this week, I pray for your children that the words they speak out of their mouth will produce after its kind in the name of Jesus. That they will choose the words of life. Because the Bible says that the, the mouth of the righteous brings out the fountain of life. I thank you that this one will speak words that will bring life in the name of Jesus Christ and that lives will be transformed everywhere they go. I thank you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. And until we see you again, Lord, I declare that they are blessed and highly favored. God bless and have a wonderful night.